Well, good evening and thank you so much for joining with us again on another Wednesday night on Facebook. We really do appreciate that. We're here to study the Word of God together. And so if you're listening in and you don't come to our church, well, you're very, very welcome. And for others who are listening in again from our own church, I hope that you're all keeping well, staying safe, and you're very welcome as well. Now, we want to turn our thoughts to God's Word again tonight to continue with the little uh, subject that we have been considering, which is, of course, important questions regarding evangelism. And just before we read the Word of God together, let's bow our hearts in God's presence and let's ask for his blessing upon us and for his help. Let's just pray briefly as we come to God's Word. Our God and our Father, we come again to you this evening in the precious name of your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We approach you in the only way that we can come, in the name of your Son and resting on the merits of his finished work on that cruel cross at Calvary. We thank you that through his death and resurrection, that he has opened up for us a new and a living way that enables us, our Father, to come just now and to wait in your most holy presence. Father, we thank you for this means of access. We thank you that we come to you not only by way of invitation, but also with that great assurance that you hear and you answer our prayers. We bow, Father, with worship on our hearts. We bow to thank you for all your goodness to us. We praise you for everything that the grace of God has done in these lives of ours. And we thank you, Father, for your daily provision in that you continually meet our needs. And, Father, we want to thank you for that. We never want to be guilty of taking any of our temporal blessings for granted. But Father, we thank you most of all tonight for our spiritual blessings. We thank you for ever sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to be our Saviour. Many of us from personal experience can say that the Son of God loved me and he gave himself for me. Father, will never be able to fully understand the wonder of it all, but we know that the Lord Jesus Christ was willing to come and willing to lay down his life on that old rugged cross, even though he had no sin of his own. We thank you that he was willing to take the sinner's place and they die the death that we should have died, and he paid a debt that we could never pay. So, Father, thank you for the Son of your love. Thank you for everything that was accomplished on that centre cross at Calvary. Thank you tonight that the tomb is empty and that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive and that he is alive forevermore. Father, we want to thank you for your precious word of truth. We want to thank you that we have your word in our own language and we thank you that we're able to come this evening and meet together around your word. And Father, we do earnestly pray that the Holy Spirit will teach us the things of Christ, that he will prepare our hearts for the entrance of your word. And Father, we pray that we will learn much from your word tonight. But Father, we pray that what we learn, we will put into practice daily as we seek to live before others and as we seek to share the gospel of your grace with them. We remember all who listen in tonight, you know us individually, you know all about our individual needs. And we pray, Father, that you would minister to us in these days especially for many who might feel down and discouraged as a result of the ongoing lockdown. We commend such people to you and pray, Father, that you would presence yourself with them. 
We think of those in our fellowship who have been on well, and we ask, Lord, for your hand to be upon each one of them, and if it pleases you, that you would restore them back again to a full measure of health and strength. We pray, Father, for others on Facebook tonight and by other means who are seeking to share the Word of God with others. Father, we just thank you that despite the fact that we cannot meet in our church buildings, we thank you that the Word of God is not bound. And for all who handle your Word this evening, we pray for God's blessing upon them. And we pray that we will all benefit from hearing the voice of God through his word this evening. So come to us, our Father, just now. Forgive us our sin and wherein we have failed you. We pray that the Spirit of God will empower us and enable us to bring God's word to God's people. Hear our prayers and continue with us, we ask in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, turn with me if you've got a Bible tonight, and we're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again, beginning at verse 1. We have read this before, but I'm going to read it again because some of the things that I will mention tonight are found in this particular chapter. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read from verse 1. Now, in this great chapter on the doctrine of the resurrection, the Apostle Paul says this, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains unto this present but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I laboured more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Amen. God will bless this reading of his word to all our hearts. Important questions regarding evangelism is the topic that we have been taking as our studies on a Wednesday night for our Bible study. 
It's a very important subject, particularly in the days in which you and I live, when perhaps we feel the days are dark and difficult, and they probably are. And yet, despite all of that, these are days when God is giving us countless opportunities individually to share his word, and also over the means of the internet and in other ways, God is giving us the opportunity to share the gospel with others. But what is the message of the gospel? That is what we have been thinking about for these last two Wednesday evenings. Well, the Apostle Paul helps us because when he came to the city of Corinth, this is what he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, as far as the Apostle Paul himself was concerned, the message that he preached was not the message of men, it was the testimony of God. As he reminds us in Romans chapter 1, the gospel is the gospel of God. It reveals God's truth, and that truth is centered in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I reminded us of two things regarding the gospel that God has entrusted into our care. The first thing is that it is a biblical message. Now, we can use different methods to reach different age groups, but there is only one gospel message when we must not rewrite it to make it more acceptable for the world in which we live. And we should never assume that people understand the message, nor that they would understand many of the terms that you and I take for granted. So we need to begin by reminding them that God is the creator of all things. God has created all things. He sustains all things. And God wants the very best for us. And because of that, God sent his Son into the world to be our Savior. So we must present God as the Savior of all men. God sent his Son to be our Savior. He died on the cross, and that means that you and I can have life more abundant in Jesus, and we can know the forgiveness of our sins. And Paul himself believed that with all his heart, having been transformed by the power of the gospel, and the main theme of his message was Christ and him crucified. Now, when you and I think about the cross, we must remember that this truth is evident in the Gospels. It's in the writings of Paul and the epistle to the Hebrews, the writings of the apostle Peter, the writings of John, the book of Revelation, and also for the last 2,000 years of church history, this is the message that the church has preached. Now, sadly, that seems to be changing in many places, but you and I have the responsibility to be faithful to the message God has entrusted into our care. It is a biblical message, and we cannot change it. But secondly, I also reminded us that it is a personal message. It relates to personal experience. In other words, the gospel message is for every single man or woman, boy or girl. And it demands a personal response. People cannot turn around and say, this gospel is not for me, because the reality is you're either for Christ or you are against Christ. You cannot remain neutral as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. So it is a biblical message. It's a personal message. And I went on to expand that a little bit to give you an idea of the content of the message that we preach. Now, I turn your thoughts to Acts chapter 2, to that great message that the Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, where he defended those believers 
But he also declared that the one who had been taken at the hands of evil men and crucified was none other than Jesus Christ, their Lord and Messiah. Now, if you and I learn from that message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and other messages that we read of in the scriptures, there are a number of things that we must do when we bring the gospel to others. First of all, we need to stress the need of repentance. Men and women need to turn from their sin and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve disciples, they all spoke about the need for repentance. And of course, repentance is vitally important. It involves the mind being awakened. It involves the heart feeling its guilt. It involves the will being changed. And it involves a complete turnaround. Repentance is a complete transformation in the life of those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. But secondly, we need to stress the nature of salvation. And I know that when you and I talk about salvation, it's a very wide and a very comprehensive term because there's salvation in the past, also in the present, and also in the future. There's salvation from the penalty and the power, and one day from the very presence of sin itself. There's salvation and there's ongoing sanctification, there's justification, and one day there will be glorification. Now, all of these terms are important to our understanding of this term salvation, and we must not try to cover up terms like these. If people don't understand them in our day and generation, then we have the responsibility to explain those terms to them. And of course, there are some other things that we need to remember. We need to teach people about the humanity of Christ. We need to tell them how he came and why he came into our world. We need to teach people about the deity of Christ, not to explain he was really man, and yet he is also truly God. We need to teach people about the character of Christ. He knew no sin, he did no sin, and yet he was willing to take the sinner's place, and only one who knew no sin could do that. We need to teach people about the love of Christ. There's no other love quite like his love, and in love he gave himself for us. And we need to teach people about the death of Christ. And that's where we really left it last Wednesday night. And that's where I want to pick it up again. Because you see, this message of the gospel that we preach is centered on the cross. And Christianity in itself is a religion of redemption. It's a message of atonement. And we must emphasize that the death of Christ was absolutely necessary if men and women and boys and girls and young people are going to be saved. Now, as far as the death of Christ is concerned, you and I can relate to that death from our own experience because we have come to know Christ as our Savior. But many of the people that we meet in this uh, on church age, many of them don't understand what the death of Christ is all about. So here are some things that you and I could tell them about the death of Christ. The first thing is that his death was voluntary. In other words, he laid it down by choice. In that great chapter in John chapter 10, where we're introduced to that great passage on the shepherd and the sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ says this in John 10, 17 and 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now we do know from the reading of Scripture the Godward side to the death of Christ because God sent his Son 
to be the saviour of the world. And we know also that there were those who took the Lord Jesus Christ and they led him to that cross to be crucified. But Jesus is very clear about this. I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ was voluntary. He laid down his life by choice. The second thing about his death is this. His death was sacrificial. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life as a sacrifice for sinners, but he himself was that perfect sacrifice, and he offered himself, therefore, unto death that your sins and mine might be forgiven. Again, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, thinking about the past and teaching about the past, Paul says this, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So his death was not just voluntary in that he laid it down, but also it was sacrificial. He gave himself as a sacrifice for sin. But thirdly, his death was substitutionary, and that makes it even more personal, because Jesus Christ died in our guilty room instead. Remember that whenever Paul writes to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 5, the apostle says this, he says, God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His death was substitutionary. He died instead of us, instead of him. It should have been me, it should have been you, but Jesus Christ took our place. He died on behalf of us. His death was vicarious. Jesus Christ did something for us that we could never, ever do for ourselves. His death was voluntary. He laid it down by choice. His death was sacrificial. He was the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for sin. His death was substitutionary because Jesus Christ died for us. He took our place and he died our death. But the fourth thing is this, that his death was sufficient because the Lord Jesus Christ finished the work that the Father had given him to do. Whenever John gives us his account of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he reminds us that while Jesus was on the cross, dying not for his own sin, but for the sin of this old world, before the Lord Jesus Christ bowed his head and gave up the ghost, He said, it is finished. It is finished. What was finished? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was not finished because death was not the end for him, as you and I will discover tonight. But the work that the Father had asked him to do was finished. Jesus Christ has paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And Jesus Christ has done everything necessary for sinners like you and for me to be saved. He has satisfied the demands that God had placed upon the sinner, and because of the sufficiency of his death, there is a way back tonight to God from the dark paths of sin. Now, what an encouragement that is for us as we go out with the gospel. And whether we do it collectively or whether we do it individually, we have got a tremendous message to bring to this world in which we live. Christ died that we might live. His death was voluntary. His death was sacrificial. His death was substitutionary. And thank God his death was sufficient. You and I believe that. The world outside knows little of that. 
and you and I must explain to them what the death of Jesus Christ means and everything that the death of Jesus Christ has accomplished. So when it comes to the message of the gospel, we need to teach people about the humanity of Christ, about the deity of Christ, about the character of Christ, about the love of Christ, about the death of Christ. But also as far as this message is concerned, sixthly, we need to teach people about the resurrection of Christ. You see, there can be no doubt that the message of the gospel is a triumphant message. Christ has died and the tomb is empty and the Lord Jesus Christ is a living saviour and that's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. If you were to talk to people tonight whose faith is in somebody from the past or some particular cult that has had leaders who have lived and died, they could take you tonight to those tombs, the tombs of their leaders, and they could say to you, listen, this is where our leader is buried. But you and I can go to a tomb where our leader is buried. He's not there. The Lord Jesus Christ is alive and he is alive forevermore. The tomb is empty. Jesus Christ has risen again. The gospel is a message of victory and it's a triumphant message. And God forgive us when we don't believe that and we, when we don't tell others about it. You and I know that we live in a world tonight that is very sceptical regarding the Christian faith. I say that for a number of reasons. It's a world that is cynical concerning the Christian message. People just don't believe it. It's too simplistic. It's too good to be true. And they don't believe it. It's a world that is critical of the Christian church. Doesn't matter what the church says, does or represents, the world outside is critical of the Christian church. And the world outside is critical of the Christians themselves because they see too many half-hearted people who show little evidence of living out their faith and of living life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Or oh, they may give out tracts and they'll talk to people and they say that Jesus Christ has died and that he has risen again from the dead and yet they live as if Jesus Christ is still in the tomb. Beloved, the tomb is empty. The Lord Jesus Christ has risen again from the dead and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has changed everything. He's not only a loving Saviour, but He is a living Saviour. And you've heard me say this before, but it needs to be repeated time and time again. Whenever we talk about the death of Jesus Christ and whenever we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, both of these things are inseparably linked. And Paul makes that clear in what we have read tonight in 1 Corinthians 15. He puts it like this, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now Jesus Christ tasted death, the Bible says, for every man, but death was not the end. He's very much alive and he is alive forevermore. Remember that after his resurrection, he was seen alive, Paul says, by many infallible proofs. He was seen alive by Mary. Mary who had waited at the tomb and wondered where the body of Jesus was gone. And when he spoke to her, she thought he was the gardener until he called her Mary and he 
He spoke in such tender tones that she knew who he was and she called him Master. He was seen alive by Mary. He was seen alive by Peter. He was seen alive by the eleven disciples. He was seen alive by over 500 people at one time. And he was seen alive by the Apostle Paul. Beloved God has raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. So you and I can be confident in the message that God has entrusted to us. If the Lord Jesus Christ was dead, you and I would still be dead in our sins. We'd have no hope in time. There would be no hope beyond the grave. People in our world would just come and they would die and go out into eternity. But that's not true. We have a message that changes everything. Don't forget that Calvary is a completed work. When God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he was completely satisfied with the work that his son had accomplished. Everything asked of Jesus Christ on behalf of the sinner was completed. And God raised him from the dead and God now declares the work of Jesus Christ on that cross is sufficient to save the vilest of sinners. Do you ever sometimes get involved with someone in conversation and you know them and you know about their background and you look at them and you realize well there's a deep dyed sinner if ever i saw one they'll never be saved how do you know that how do i know that the death of christ is sufficient to save the vilest of sinners you want an example of that you take the Apostle Paul himself, a persecutor of the church, a man who described himself as injurious, a man who took great delight in going after the children of God and hounding them and casting them into prison. This is a man who stood at the close of Stephen consenting on to his death and this man became a preacher, and this man became the greatest missionary perhaps who has ever lived. Why? Because the gospel changed him. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. If you have been praying for years for a loved one, a husband, a son, a wife, or whoever it might be, don't give up. Keep praying and keep pleading for them. And keep telling them about the love of God and Christ for them. Because the gospel really works. Calvary's a completed work and Calvary secures our future. If Christ had not died and risen again from the dead, our future would be bleak. Paul says we would be of all men miserable. If Christ had not risen again, we would still be in our sins. And you and I, to put it as kindly as I can, you and I would be on our way out into a Christless eternity. But because Christ has died, and because Christ has risen again from the dead, we have hope today. We have a bright hope for tomorrow. Because you and I share in the victory of his resurrection and because he lives, those of us who have put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, well, we live also. I love the words of the hymn writer in that great hymn, Thine be the glory, risen conquering Son, endless is the victory thou or death hast won. One of the verses says, No more we doubt thee, glorious Prince of life. Life is not without thee. Aid us in our strife. Make us more than conquerors through thy deadless love. Bring us safe through Jordan to thy home above 
thine be the glory. Listen, risen, conquering Son, endless is the victory. Thou or death hast won. What a message we have to proclaim tonight to the nations of the world, whether at home or whether abroad. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen indeed, and he's able to save to the very uttermost all who will come unto God by him. We need to teach people about the humanity of Christ, who he is, why he came, the deity of Christ, that he is the God-man, the character of Christ, he had no sin yet took the sinner's place, the love of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. And here's something else, seventhly, we need to teach people about the second coming of Christ. In John chapter 14, which I'm sure is a very familiar chapter, to all of us and a very, very personal, encouraging chapter for many of God's people tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ, soon to go by way of the cross and to leave his disciples, spoke to them in the midst of discouragement. And in John 14, he said this to them. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ was soon going to leave them. He must go by way of the cross because he must be obedient to the Father's will. But they had a bright and a glorious future to look forward to, for even though Jesus Christ would die, he would rise again triumphantly from the dead. He would ascend back to his Father in heaven to the glory that was rightfully his before the worlds began. But one day he would come back again, and he would take those who were his to heaven to be with himself. One day he would come back for his own, and he would take them to be with him, and they will be with him eternally, never ever to be parted again. I think it's sad in many respects that we don't really hear very much today about the Lord's return, it's a subject that has almost disappeared in the life of the Christian church today. Yet that ought, ought to be the case, because the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ should thrill the heart of every child of God. The Bible tells us that his coming is sure, absolutely certain. We may disagree, some of us, about the nature of this, but at the end of the day, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely certain. He said, if I go, I will come again. The Bible tells us that his coming will be sudden. It will take place in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The Bible tells us that his coming will separate. It will separate those who are saved from those who are not. Now you and I don't know exactly when he will come. All the signs of the times in which we live would suggest to us perhaps that the coming of the Lord is drawing near, and you might be saying in your heart, but pastor, I agree with you. Look at the signs. Look at what's happening. The Lord Jesus Christ might soon come. Well, if that's the case, what are we doing about the subject of evangelism? Surely if the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again, and we believe that that could be imminent, he could come at any time, then surely that would make us individually and collectively 
be more urgent about this great matter of evangelism. Jesus is coming, the hymn writer says, sing the glad word, coming for those he redeemed by his blood. You and I have so much to look forward to. Yes, maybe tonight as a believer in Christ, times are tough and you're going through difficult situation. We'll look up tonight and look on to the end because Jesus is coming and heaven awaits you and you're going to soon see him as he is. And according to the Apostle John, you and I are going to be like him. Oh, thank God for the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the offering, it offers people hope knowing that Jesus is coming again. It gives them a sense of urgency that they can't trail their feet spiritually. And we need to tell them about this great salvation that they need to seek the Lord in time, because in eternity it will be forever too late. What do we tell people regarding the message of the gospel? Tell them about the humanity of Christ. Tell them about the deity of Christ, the character of Christ, the love of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ and the second coming of Christ. You say to me, but hold on a moment, John. We can't include all of those truths in one sermon. That's true. And that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm simply suggesting is this, that as far as the gospel is concerned, we have a responsibility to teach these things to people and at the same time to be honest with them regarding their sin and regarding their soul. The Lord Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, offers them hope. And you and I must seek to bring that hope to them. We need to stress the need of repentance, and there's much involved in that. We need to stress the nature of salvation, and again, that's a very comprehensive thing. But thirdly, we need to stress the nature of God's grace. Men and women cannot save themselves. In the previous church I got to know a man that I would have met often on the street when I would have been going up and down the street to the bank. We began to talk about many things and he was talking about Christian things. He knew who I was and I asked the man, tell me this, are you a Christian? He said, no I'm not. But he says, there's a time coming when I'm going to become a Christian. And I said, when would that time be? Oh, he said, I never thought of it. Not yet, but he says, I'll tell you this before I die. I'm going to get right with God. I'm going to, I, I've made a bargain with God about this. Friends, you don't make a bargain with God when it comes to the matter of salvation. And men and women tonight in our world need to understand that they cannot save themselves. Paul makes that abundantly clear in writing to the believers at Ephesus. He said to them that salvation was not brought about by any human effort. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved, through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's something else that we need to stress. Men and women cannot fool about in their sin and fool about with God. If they're ever going to be saved, they need to throw themselves on the mercy and on the grace of God. You see, grace is defined in many different ways, but grace is simply God's love freely shown towards sinners. It is God showing his goodness to people who deserve nothing but the judgment of God. 
And when we speak about God's grace, we speak about something that ought to humble us. We've all heard of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who for many years ministered in Westminster Chapel in London. He was a very able Bible expositor. He has written many valuable books that I'm sure we have benefited from. But speaking of grace, Lloyd-Jones said this, Everything is of grace in the Christian life from the very beginning to the very end. That's a very humbling statement, but it's true. Let me just mention two things quickly about this grace as I close. First of all, we need to consider the meaning of his grace. This theme of grace runs right throughout the scriptures. And that's why it does and should play a very prominent part in our Christian faith. God is sim grace is simply God's unmerited favour. The Bible tells us that God's nature ebbs and flows with love, and because of that love, God reaches out in grace to creatures like us who were sinful and vile, who were worthy of nothing less than hell and all its terribleness. It's not something that can be earned. It's not something we deserve. It's not something attained by any human effort. We need to tell people about this. You can't make bargains with God. You can't meet with God on your own terms. You cannot get to that place in life where you feel that you deserve anything from God. And that means being honest and talking to people about their sin, but reminding them that God's grace is greater than all their sin. Consider the meaning of his grace. Consider the message of his grace. Beloved, remember tonight that the grace that saves is the grace that keeps, and that grace will one day bring us safely home. John Newton's great hymn tells us that amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Thank God tonight there's grace when we suffer, and there's grace when we sorrow, but there's also great grace for the sinner. God is waiting and willing to bring men and women to himself. It's not his will that any should perish. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked. And you and I therefore need to remind men and women, if they're ever going to be saved and know their sins forgiven, if they're ever going to have a home in heaven, it will not be because of anything good in them. It will be because of God's marvellous grace. It will be because Christ died that they might live, and that Christ lives tonight that they need never die. What is the message in our evangelism? It's a biblical message with the cross work of Christ at its very heart. It's a personal message and it demands a response in the heart of every individual. And as you and I bring that message to them, we need to stress the need of repentance the nature of salvation, and the nature of God's grace. May God send us out this incoming week and in weeks to come to tell people of Jesus, who is mighty and well able to save. He's alive, and he's alive forevermore, and he can save to the very uttermost all who will come to God through him. May God help us and bless his word to us tonight. Let's just pray together. 
Father, we thank you tonight for the message of the gospel. We thank you, Father, when we think about its content, that it is so comprehensive and yet so simple that even the youngest child is able to understand the way of salvation. And Father, you have commissioned us to go into all the world and take the gospel to every creature. Give us a heart for people, we pray. Help us to think about the gospel message that we ourselves might understand it and then that we might share it with others on the pathway of life. For we have a loving and a living Saviour and so many people in our world tonight know nothing about him. So help us to treat seriously the work of evangelism and help us to do our part, gossiping the gospel to others and telling them about God's love in Christ and how that the way of the cross leads home. Help us to be good evangelists, we pray, and faithful to the souls of men. We ask it all giving thanks for your goodness to us and for your grace in these lives of ours. And may your grace, mercy and peace be our portion this day and every day until Jesus comes or calls. And we ask it all in his worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. Again, on another Wednesday night, we do greatly appreciate that. And I encourage you, as I do each Wednesday night, just to take some moments at the end of our Bible study to prayerfully consider what God says to us, and then to pray for the needs of our community, to pray for the needs of our church, to pray for our country, to pray for other countries in our world, to thank God tonight for the fact that bit by bit we seem to be seeing an easing in the lockdown and not only that but thank God that over these past few days there have been no deaths and we've been praying about this coronavirus, we've been asking God to intervene and we ought to thank God tonight and pray for other places across our world where so many people are still dying that God will give the leaders of our governments right across the world wisdom and help as they seek to deal with this particular issue. So if you can, just take a few minutes quietly in your own individual heart or perhaps with your family there in your home. Take a few minutes and pray and ask for God's blessing. God willing, we will be back again live on Sunday on Facebook, 11.30 in the morning, looking at the book of Colossians. And what a wonderful passage we come to on Sunday morning in Colossians 3 and then in the evening studies in the book of Genesis we're in the life of Joseph at the moment and so many lessons to learn so if you can join with us on Sunday coming please do that and you'll be made most welcome there will be singing for half an hour you can follow the link and you can sing along with the hymns prior to both services so thank you for joining us tonight please take care Stay safe and may we each one know God's blessing upon us.